Hola, buenos días. Hello and good morning. Thank you for invi inviting me to be here. I guess you agree with me. You enjoyed the video, right? Yes, it was very tough to do it. To record the whole thing was very tough to shoot it. And mainly, it has been very, very hard. You know, the making of a video, that one was very hard too, even much harder. Because to be able to do this, it is true that we had many accidents, failures, some, uh, you know, accidents in the team, projects that we were not able to finally develop because we had no financial means but it is true that at the end of the day we also had quite a lot of successes we tend to talk only about success but two years ago i decided to talk too about positive mistakes about failures because we are the result of everything we are the result of success but also the result of our failures and this is essential for entrepreneurship and this is what i'm going to come here and talk about i'm an adventurer it is true that i am also an entrepreneur in quite an intense way too it is true that I have been successful sometimes, I have failed very often too, but I'm going to be talking from the perspective of adventure as a metaphor to then talk about entrepreneurs, because I think that these two concepts are very similar. And also because there are many experts here who know a lot about enterprises, but you know, about adventure, it is true that maybe some of you don't know too much about it, but I'm going to be talking about being an entrepreneur in the future, entrepreneurship in the future, because I tend to think that adventurers and explorers, what they do is to try and go there to discover the future and those virgin territories. They dare to go there to go and discover, see what they find see what happens. And this is what I'm going to be telling you about. I will be sharing with you certain concepts which are key for entrepreneurship today, but mainly concepts which are key for entrepreneurship in the future. I will be showing pictures of myself. They are my own pictures. They don't come from Google. Here comes the first one. This is one of my favorite pictures. It is true that very often the pictures we show, you know, it is as if they have been pre-designed. Last week I was in a mountain in the Concagua and the future was beautiful and I was there. In this position, it is true that the picture was beautiful, but that was prepared, but not this one. This one was spontaneous. This is the McKinley Summit, the highest mountain in the US, in Alaska. And before, I would like to tell you something about this picture. I climbed this mountain in the year 2009 and I was doing this project of the seven summits, the highest summits in each continent. And at that point, people, you know, they didn't know that I had the McKinley. But last year, in May or in June last year, there was a guy that you all may know, Kilian Jermet. Well, I know him very well. And I said, oh, come on, you are boycotting, you, you, you are doing all the mountains, but what is he doing? He's doing just the same thing as I do. He just climbs those mountains through the same route. This mountain, well, a year ago, he went up there following the same route from the base camp up to the summit, following exactly the same path and the same route as I did. He reached the same height just like me, all that in 11 hours and a half. And then everybody was talking about him and that's unfair. What about me? I did exactly the same thing and also in 11 hours and a half, but <laughs> 11 hours and a half, but in 11 days. That is the little difference between both of us. 11 hours and a half, but it took me 11 days, because people like himself, he is the top, he's at the very top, he's the elite. You need to have a special talent to be like him. How many of us are elite entrepreneurs? How many of us are the best ones? It is true that, uh, you know, this is a topic that I know about very well, and now that I am 24 years old, yes, I am in my 20s, well, I'm 48 years old, and I can say that 
as an adventurer, I'm uh, at a very exciting moment. I have many projects I want to develop, and the advantage is that I don't have too many competitors, because it is true that there are many, many people able to climb the Everest or to do an ultra marathon, many, many people, many sportsmen who are much better than myself, but people who are able, able to become entrepreneurs and to put an effort, you know, um, through two years, four years, years to organize everything, to find financing, to be able to sell it, and then also to be able even to risk your life, then there are not those, me those many, we're not talking about sports, we're talking about management, about how to manage a project, about how to be an entrepreneur. That is why I was able, you know, to enroll in those many adventures, because I always pursue my dreams from that perspective. And now I would like to share certain pictures uh, with you and I'm going to show you my office. That's my office there. That's the place where I work. It is true, it may sound pretentious, but it is true. I have a big, big map and then I say, okay, where can I go now? Right now I'm preparing a project and my intention is to go around my whole bureau, my whole office, but in a very special way. I don't know if I'll be able to make it. I've been working on this project for one year now. And uh, before, I would like to go to four special places, places where I have been in this beautiful office of mine. This is the first one, the Sahara Desert. I've been lucky enough to experience many, many things here in this area. I've been there, you know, by car in the uh, Dakar motorcycle. Also, I've been riding a bicycle there. It's been hard. I have suffered a lot. It's been hard, but it's been thrilling too. But what would I like to tell you about this race, the Dakar race? I think I've, I've been lucky enough, fortunate enough to participate at nine different editions nine different years and I have learned so many things from the management management point of view, leadership, suffering, how to go beyond problems, but something that I have learned is that it's very expensive to do it. It costs a lot of money to do that race. Well, look at the video. It is true that before you need to work a lot because there are so many people who would like to be there. And last November or December, I was in Bilbao. You know, we were delivering diplomas and giving a conference for the vocational training students. Yes, for VET students. And at that point, I was explaining, I was telling them that in a few weeks' time I would be going to South America again for the same race because now it takes place there and not in the car. And at that point, I said to them, I'm sure you are jealous, right? Would you like to be there? Who would like to be there? And they all raised their hands, all the boys there, the students, they all wanted to be there. It is true that it is a thrilling experience. And I said to them, this year I'm going to be the first pilot ever in history to be doing this very, very hard race, but without petrol, without oil in an electric car. Our sponsor was Acciona, I guess, you know, Acciona, this company. And then I said to them, well, let's imagine that Acciona develops the project, they make an electrical car. So the first thing they do is to hire engineers so that they can design and develop the car. Then they are going to have an expert at logistics so as to create the team. Once that is done, then they will say, we need a driver for the car. And then they are going to try and find the best driver. They go to info jobs, for instance, they are going to receive hundreds of CVs and they are going to, and then I said to them, well, if this is the process, the procedure, how many possibilities do they think I have to be the driver? Almost none, almost zero possibilities. To be selected, to be chosen as the driver for a car such as this one, 
such as an innovative car, this is very, very difficult because here it is in this country, in Europe, in the world, there are many, many good drivers because you know, they all are going to struggle and they all will want to obtain it. But I was the one who was chosen. And I have uh, been in the Dakar seven times, driving a car and twice a motorcycle. Because you can participate in three different ways there. Either if you are an elite driver and uh, you are spotted by a team, you are selected, you are chosen because you are the best, and there is a lot of money involved there, then 80% of those participating there are people who are millionaires. They have plenty of money, even if they have plenty of stickers on their car, but they are millionaires. And, you know, they enjoy driving, and some of them are very good at that, but they have to spend a lot of money. And then in the third group, and that's where I fit in, is just, you know, when you try and make it. And in this case, I have always been the promoter, the entrepreneur of the project, the one who proposes a plan, who establishes a strategy and who tries to sell it. But to do that, that is very hard too. That's very difficult. You cannot just go to a company and say, well, that is my dream. I have always wanted to go to Africa, to Dakar. That is my motivation. No, no, of course, they are not going to listen to you. You need to have an added value. You need to convince them, convince them that that invest the investment is going to generate a value. For entrepreneurs, it is essential. You need to generate and create value. And we were talking about that before. You need to be disruptive, to be different. You need to be innovative, to innovate. The value is there. I cannot compete against Daniel Roma, you know, uh, the leaders, etc., uh, etc. Et I cannot compete against them. But I've already been there for the nine years, and there I go again. And people say to me, but how have you made it? First, I used, you know, as a sports person, I wanted to always to be the winner. Yes, I wanted to be among the elite. And then I took a friend of mine, a good friend of mine from my village, someone who at 18 years old, uh, you know, he was better than me. He was spotted by the number one in the world, you know, uh, a motorcycle trail. And well, there was a car accident and he wasn't driving there, but you know, he suffered an accident. He was disabled. He became depressed. Then he started driving cars. And then I went to this friend and I said to, the, to him, come on, let's go to Dakar. You are going to be the first Spanish disabled person. I promoted the project. I was there. We created the project and there we were. It was the very first time that a Spanish person was doing this race in this condition. And, uh, you know, three people tried. Ragazzoni, a former driver, pilot, had tried, but he couldn't make it till the end. We were there and we finished the race. We were the very first team in history, driving only with hands, because my colleague was disabled. As I said, we were the first ones to make it. And then uh, we participated together again, but he was driving his own car and I was driving my own car. So, but that was the concept. And then there have been two more disabled drivers who are Spanish too. Esteve from South America and uh, Albert Llobera, who comes from Andorra, but well, he's um, Spanish too. There have been two more drivers two more disabled drivers. And then also I was the very first Spanish person to drive without a co-pilot. I was there on my own, all by myself. And this is our role. We need to generate this value. That is the key difference. If this is not clear, things won't work. That is why we are entrepreneurs. And something else about Dakar before talking about something else. I love Dakar because this is a project that lasts for one year. And that is something also key for entrepreneurs in the future. We need to be working around projects. And before I forgot to say that I'm not talking about an entrepreneur who is a businessman. You can be, of course, the promoter, the creator of a company, but 
you can be just any professional in a company and think that we all need to have this attitude and be entre and be enterprising. Yes, but we need to generate value and we need to work around projects more and more. Things are changing, things are changing very, very fast and there in the career it is very beautiful because you know there are many people who have huge talent working together around the same project and they are passionate about it. They share the same passion, the same enthusiasm and they are all there and they are all very good. They need the best because we are talking about very high performance and not only the pilot, the driver, but also the mechanical team, the experts or the manager of the project or the the one who is going to be looking for financing, they are all important and they all need to join hands. Entrepreneurs today, they are not there isolated, doing everything on their own and they have the vision. Yes, it is perfect to have that spirit, but then he needs a team, a team of leaders, all of them generating value. And this is something essential if you want to be an, an adventurer. Let me go now to another place in this office of mine. This is the Amazon forest. I've been here quite often, but uh, I was doing an ultra marathon, 290 kilometers all by myself, six days, and you were there on your own and you had everything uh, with you, the forest. I have visited many different places, difficult places in the world, but neither the Everest nor the desert, the hardest, the very hardest thing is the forest. And mainly here in this area, because you know, conditions, it is humid and there are so many insects too, many insects, many animals, and not all of them are nice to you. As you know, it is true that they can scare you to death. And uh, it's not easy. Traveling is great, but imagine being there, surrounded by all that, with your backpack on your back, carrying 10 kilos, and that's it. It's very complex, uh, unforeseen, a very aggressive environment, changing, ever changing. It changes all the time, but that is key to something key also for entrepreneurship is uh, changes. Jorge was talking about it. Leading projects in projects where there is no stability, where there is uncertainty, where things are changing all the time. And I would like to say something else. Yes, we need to adapt ourselves to changes. Yes, but watch out, I would say. Yes, of course, we need to adapt, but changes happen so quickly and uh, so very quickly, more and more, that we need to do more because you will end up being exhausted if you need to adapt all the time. You cannot maintain that stress. Things are unforeseen and you need to adapt. It is true, but what you need to do is to become a partner with change. Change has to become your friend, your companion. It, you cannot consider that as a threat. No, change is something that you need to take advantage of because it is advantage of. It will be providing opportunities for us. We are between hyperconnectivity, technology, globalization, changes in habits, in uses. This is changing very, very quickly. It is true that we see the light at the end of the tunnel, but then we see another shade, another shadow, because there is another tunnel behind. This is like a roller coaster. We are going up, down, we have to go through tunnels, and if it is not the global economy, it will be our sector which was thriving and successful, but now collapses, or it has changed, or it is reinventing itself, or our client has changed, or China these people are coming careful watch out this is a roller coaster as i said before for some people you know this would be very difficult and frightening but for others it is an opportunity but that is why we are adventurous because for us change represents an opportunity if i am going if i'm showing this picture i'm running right in both of them First, you can see Athens, the marathon in Athens. 
sometimes I do things like that, but usually what I do is to run in the mountain. It's very, very different. Conditions are very different. For the first one, on the left, I need uh, training. You need to be able to suffer, to be in good shape. Yes, of course, all that is important. But, you know, everything is ready for me. I'm going to be given water. There are going to be doctors, people clap at you. People say to you, you are Superman, because there you are running. You have all that support and you know you can run one every week if you are in good shape you can go and run another one in three weeks time maybe you can sprain an ankle but uh, well you can just take a taxi a cab or go to hospital or go back home but there on the right that is very different completely different if you are in the city the uncertainty, the uncertainty implies knowing if it's going to rain or not. The rest doesn't matter. So you have to count on yourself. You know, you know that you have been training and that's it. But if you have to compete and run against uh, elite people, you know, black people, they are the elite. That is different. But there you are and you know what you can give and what you can do. But in real life, the life of entrepreneurs, that is an adventure. And you need to organize everything, to invent everything. You have no water. You have no doctors. There are risks like those animals I was talking about. It is true that in enterprises, sometimes there are many animals too, and sometimes enterprises are just like the forest and you have, uh, you know, uh, people controlling if you are paying your taxes or there are draft laws and, you know, policy makers making your life difficult sometimes. It is true that in this uncertainty, it is not as much comfortable, but you have many opportunities. In Athens, there were 18,000 people running. I am very good. And I was the 3,201. I was not even in the papers. I was not on the lists. But on the right, and that was only two months later, you know, I was in good shape too. I was in a very good shape. And there I won. We won. My team won. And I was the sixth one. It was the very first time a Spanish team won. And we won out of 160 groups. And we were on the papers. They were talking about us at the different papers. Why? Because we took advantage of uncertainty. We took advantage of those opportunities because we are adventurers. And I enjoy much more that, you know, than uh, what you can do in Athens because I know that I am much more able to adapt. You are in VET. And uh, if we are talking about adventure, we are always going to places where there are surprises, unexpected things that are going to be happening. And I enjoy, I like to say that we need three different levels of capabilities. And I think that if we are talking about the adventurers or the professionals of the future, three things that are essential. And at the end of the day, that is what the companies of the future require. When we are going to be doing an ultra -marketing marathon in the Amazon forest, or if we want to cross the Antarctica, we need three capabilities. Antarctic. First, we need to know what we have, which is our experience. We need to know about which are, about it, which are our capabilities. We need to know about our know-how. But it is true that we're going to extreme conditions to a forest full of obstacles and dangers. And that is why maybe we will need to acquire more skills, new skills, ongoing training. That is very important. I'm going to the forest, so before, maybe I will be working with the fire brigade, and I spent there two days with the fire brigade so that they could teach me different techniques so as to be able to survive in the forest. 
not just from the point of view of eating this or that, but not being bitten, bitten by an insect. Yes, where should you sleep? Of course, you cannot lie on the ground and you need uh, to pay attention and always verify that there is not a spider or anything else. And you need to kill that insect or that animal or for instance in certain areas of the forest you need to protect your legs up to your knees. I haven't tried this but I have seen it. There are videos. There are snakes. Snakes, uh, even the fastest uh, ones, they can never bite you above your knees. Not because there is a law. No, there is no law about it. The problem is that they cannot reach you. So if you protect your legs, the more you protect yourself, the better. You need to get adapted to learn, to incorporate new skills for that new adventure. And at the same time, maybe you need to forget about certain things because sometimes experience also implies having prejudices which are not going to be good because you have always been doing things in this way and now maybe you need to change things and to do things in a different way. That is the second level of capabilities. But the third one is much more important, much more important when I am going to choose and create a team, something essential for me is to be able to learn and to acquire new skills, but there on the spot when you are there right in the middle. That is essential, to have the attitude, to have the willingness and the capacity and the capability to learn right there. When there's no time, when there's no alternative, you can't say, OK, I'm going to nip off and study this for a year and I'll come back and then I'll see how I can get over this little problem. No, you've got to learn on the hoof. You've got to develop your abilities at a given moment in time on the hoof. And that's because changes so quickly you need people that have the experience to learn on the hoof all the time and that have the right attitude this is something that Jorge mentioned if you think you're going to start if you, if you wait until you see everything clear before you start journeying you're never going to start along your journey you're never going to be an adventure you're never going to go into the jungle or into the antarctic if you want to have everything under control everything envisaged and the opportunity will just be lost so it's very important to have the ability to carry on learning to learn on the hoof i'm now going to go to a different environment now i'm going to go to the mountains this is everest this is the highest peak in the world very difficult this is the Kumbu Glacier, which has a different name as well. They call it the Rus Russian Roulette Glacier. So you can imagine you've got to spend about three hours crossing this uh, glacier that you know it's nicknamed Russian Roulette. And it's very well named because the glacier initially is flat but then it becomes like a waterfall it's like suspended and there's these huge blocks of ice that are suspended and there's this thing called the force of gravity which means that many of these blocks just fall down at four o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the afternoon and if you just happen to be caught in the middle you're going to have a difficult time last year there was an accident in which i think 15 16 sherpas died all of a sudden 16th of may On the 60th of May, it was five years exactly since I'd been in the Everest, but and I wanted to celebrate it, but unfortunately it really wasn't the time to celebrate it, especially when you think about what's happening in Nepal at the moment. Another key when we talk about being enterprising and entrepreneurial spirit is knowing how to cross this crack. That might sound obvious, but it's important because you know what happens if you don't cross over that crack, you're just going to fall down into it. And you know what happens if you fall down into it? You're just going to die. And that's kind of painful, of course. What I'm saying is there's a risk out there. There are risks out there. And professional, occupational, high-level, entrepreneurial projects, you can prepare for with lots of strategy. But at the end of the day, as Jorge said, you've got to walk your talk. 
And sometimes you jeopardizing everything in specific moments in time, specific moments in time that are going to make a difference between success and failure. You know, there are lots and lots of obstacles out there. There are cracks, there are gullies, there are um, mountains. This is the final uh, point before you reach the summit. This is what's called Hillary's Step. You know, Hillary was the first one together with Sherpa Teng, say, to reach the summit of Everest. So that's why it's called the Hillary step, not the Tenseng step, but it's the final, final obstacle. You have to overcome all sorts of obstacles, but you need to be aware of the fact as an entrepreneur that you're going to have to manage risk all the time. It's not just a matter of accepting that there's danger. Risk needs to be managed and something serious might happen to you. Something really, really serious might happen to you. When I'm driving in the Dakar race, of course, it's far more uh, dangerous than just driving from Vic to Barcelona. And yet the problem is if I'm in Vic, which is a village in Catalonia, actually I don't have control uh, over everything because there are other people out there who are controlling the roads and I don't always know uh, what I'm doing. But when I'm in the Dakar race, I, I'm actually managing risk continually. You have to be experts at risk management. We have to be risk managers par excellence when we're in De Dakar and you have to do it. You can't just talk about it. You need to walk the talk. You need to get involved in risk. You need to accept the culture of risk. And it's difficult. It's very painful. When you innovate, when you want to be involved in disrupted innovation, you've got to be prepared to run risks and not just talk about it. You've got to be there because when you are out there, you're the one that has to cross the gully. You're the one that can die of uh, hypothermia. You're the one that's not going to reach the summit. When I went to the Antarctic, let's just talk a few minutes about the Antarctic, I knew that if I had to be evacuated, they were going to take between three and five days to come and rescue me because you can only be rescued if, firstly, the helicopter that's coming to rescue has perfect visibility because obviously a helicopter has to try to find uh, where you are. They need to look at all the different obstacles that are out there, all the gullies are there. And the other condition is that you need virtually no wind at all. These are two conditions, which means that on average, uh, it takes three to five days if you need to be rescued. And I've actually been stuck out there for 15 days. And so risk management means heading off things. Entrepreneurs need to be one step ahead of everything that's going on. And they need to manage risk as best they can. They need to deal with anything that's unforeseen. I've lost a couple of friends and I've lost them going up a mountain. And Apurna was one of the mountains. And Apurna, uh, actually, my friend died. He was a Canadian friend because he suddenly had peritonitis, 3,500 meters up a mountain. I mean, the thing is, if you get peritonitis and you're down here in the city, you just go to hospital and you go to intensive care unit. The other person who died was Manuel Matra, a Spanish gentleman who in 2004 uh, also died from peritonitis. So the risk is out there. And I know that if I go to a place and I get peritonitis, I'm going to take between, they're going to need between three to five um, days to come and rescue me. And you know that risks out there. I actually asked to have my appendix taken out before I went up a mountain. I had a programmed appendectomy. I mean, I knew I was going up a mountain. I thought, I better have my appendix out because if I get appendicitis when I'm up the mountain or peritonitis, I'm not going to survive. And they couldn't believe it in the hospital because I came in and said, can I put myself in for an appendicitis? But that's what, it hap that's what happens. You have to head off risk. You have to be one step ahead of risk. People talk a lot about the culture of failure. And people always refer to Silicon Valley and the culture of uh, failure. But there are many, many brave people here in uh, Spain who risk things. And for example, in Dakar, I got things wrong. And I've tried to make use of the fact that I got things wrong. I've tried to make use of failure to explain the risks involved, to learn from that failure, to try to analyze that. But people aren't, anal aren't interested in that. They don't, don't want to hear stories, failure stories. They want to hear success stories. 
but it's actually interesting and important to talk about failure and to talk about risk. Let's now have a look at this map. This is our ma the map of how we climbed Everest. I don't know if we have a pointer here. I think you can see it, yes. Here you've got base camp. This is the Kumu or the Russian Roulette Valley. This is uh, camp number one, number two, three, and four. And from there, we uh, headed up to the summit. So when you're at camp four, you're 8,000 meters above sea level. That, by that time, we'd already uh, planned how we were going to approach the summit. We were going to leave at uh, eight o'clock in the morning. We'd actually studied the climate and we'd been studying the climate for a month and a half and we thought there was a small window of opportunity. We thought there was going to be a possibility to attack the summit, but we were only going to have one chance because if you try it twice, you just become exhausted. And so we had to take a key decision. It was nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. The wind was still blowing strong. We spoke to the base camp. We asked Mark, our weather forecaster in Belgium, what should we do? And he said, no, 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 you, the, the wind's going to die. The wind's going to die. You need to take a decision quickly. Shall we risk it or not? So we spoke to Mark in Belgium, our weather forecaster. We spoke to that leader of our expedition. OK, let's go. Let's go. We went up 200 meters and we decided that if the wind hadn't stopped blowing so strongly, we'd turn around and go back again. We just needed to attack the summit of Everest. So you take the decision as a team. But there's a tremendous difference. If things go wrong, Mark will be very disappointed and the expedition leader will be very upset. But we just won't come back. So that's the major difference. And this is a little bit uh, the culture of the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is who, the person who risks his all or her all. It's important to say, see what you're doing. What are you risking? What are you putting in jeopardy? It's very important to know that. Because sometimes People take decisions depending on whether it's their lives at risk or their money is at risk or somebody else's money or life that's at risk. Some people earn millions and millions of dollars a year taking risky decisions, but they're not committed necessarily. They're not engaged. Their lives aren't at risk. And it's vital in when we talk about entrepreneurship of the future, when there's so much competitiveness we need to add value. We need to add something else. We need to be disruptive. We need to make sure that the team, not just the person that founds the company, but the team is all on board on the project. If you don't have the team on board with you, you won't get anywhere. You can hire somebody on an hourly rate, and you can ask that person just to tighten nuts and bolts in your company. But if you want a team, you want a team that's involved. They have to be involved, engaged. They have to be committed. They have to pledge their all. And this, in the entrepreneurial spirit of the future, is going to be important. And knowledge, as we said previously, needs to be coordinated. These people have to be involved, engaged. Everybody needs to be jeopardizing or risking something in this project. You need teams that are committed you need high-performance entrepreneurial teacher. Now I'm going to move on to the next scenario. We're now going to go down to the bottom of the office. We've been to the top of the office. Now we're going to go down to the bottom of the office. And after I went up to the top of Everest, I never thought I'd go so far south, right down to the southern hemisphere, to the south Pole. Now then, the expedition to the South Pole is supposed to be one of the greatest adventures that's out there. Of course, together with the North Pole expedition, we went from the Antarctic coast to the geographical South Pole. We managed to do so. We were the first Spaniards to do so, the fourth expedition that had gone out, but we were the first to make it without any help. Several things happened when I was there, but to be brief, the first thing that happened to me was that I started out with a colleague and I spent two weeks blocked inside my tent because it was a terrible, terrible storm. You get storms in the Antarctic that can last for a day or two days. We didn't realize it was going to last for two weeks. And we spent two weeks inside a tent. It became like a prison. We thought we were never going to get out of that tent. We didn't even 
think we were going to be rescued. Because you remember those two conditions that I said needed to be met? There was no way they were going to be met. We were never going to get out of there. There was no visibility, and it was always very, very windy. But I said to my colleague, listen, I'm not going to die here from appendicitis. Remember that, because I've already had mine out. So I had mine out before I came. So I've got one certainty in my life in a very uncertain situation. This is what happened. When it cleared up, when the weather cleared up, the climate got better. Because sometimes after uh, a storm, you get calm. You get a calm period of weather. But sometimes it doesn't happen like that. After a storm, you get a tsunami. And it was true that it became sunny, the wind died down. But my colleague, the person that I'd been working with, had a problem with his foot. He decided he couldn't carry on. We were still at a uh, very near base camp. We'd only actually moved 31 kilometers from base camp. We still had 1,170 kilometers to go. So we were still in a position where we could be evacuated. It was very difficult to be evacuated, but he still could be evacuated. So he decided to for them to come and rescue him. And I decided to stay. We'd done 31 kilometers, and I said we still had 1,170 kilometers to do. It was a difficult time to decide what to do, but I was clear about what I was going to do. Because amongst other things, I was very ambitious in this project. I wanted my project to be successful. I wanted to reach my goal. I wanted to be there. Another important thing about entrepreneurial spirit is not just being an enterprising person, but you need to be ambitious as well. Ambitious in a, in a good sense. Sometimes ambitious has a different tinge to it, but you need to be ambitious. And no, attitude, it's not just so much attitude, you need to be ambitious as well. You can have good ambitions, you can have bad ambitions. ambitions. But if you don't really, really, really want something, if you don't really, really want to achieve something, you probably won't achieve it. And you'll just spend your time trying to find excuses, not solutions. It's very important to have ambition. Where does ambition come from? Well, it comes from being convinced of what you're doing. And you know I may be talking to, about philosophy now, but I think it's important. It's very important to get involved in a project within your professional life or your business life Get involved in important, something important, something that will take you many years of effort because you'll concentrate your efforts on that and not something else. And so if something goes wrong, you might lose a lot of time. So you've got to be truly convinced. You've got to be truly convinced that you want to achieve your objective. You, don't need, you can't just think, oh, it's something that has to be done. No, 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 you can't go down to the Antarctic thinking like that. If you don't know why you're in the Antarctic, what your objective is, what your purpose is, you'll never get there. Why are your hopes put into this project? Is this project part of you? Is it part of your life project? These are the questions that you need to ask yourself. You might be saying, oh, what are stupid things this guy is talking to us about? But no, no, you need to have clear why you're there. If you're not clear about why you're doing something, don't do them because there's going to be a lot of obstacles in your path and you're going to give up. You're going to give up really, really easily. It's important possible to be successful if you don't love what you do and if you don't love what you do even if you achieve it you're a failure you're a failure it's all very well climbing a mountain it's all very well risking everything but it's no good saying at the end oh i didn't really want to go up this mountain i want to go up to a, a different mountain mountain there's no point because you're just spending a lot of time on something that you're not really interested in you need to do your homework first uh, and you don't have to apologize for letting me get a bit philosophical but it's very very important and another and it's far more important than what people that um, practice sport use which is a chronometer but we, in extreme sports, what we use is a compass. A compass tells you which direction to go in. And that's where you get your commitment from, your motivation from. That's where it all comes from. And I'm going to give you an example of this. This is the tent that I said to you was my home, as it were, for two weeks in the Antarctic. We were always between 30 and 50 degrees below uh, zero, and the wind was always uh, stronger than 100 kilometers an hour. And I'm not exaggerating here. But afterwards, I was left on my own, and I carried on, carried on my own for 48 days until I reached the South Pole. It was tough. I'm not going to deny it. It was tough because I was pulling behind me 
a sledge which weighed, I think, 134 kilos. But as I started eating what was on the kilo on the sledge, it got sort of lighter. And I spent, on average, 10 hours a day dragging that stupid sledge behind me in very uncomfortable, tough conditions. Sometimes I spent eight hours a day walking. Another, I spent 12 hours a day walking. But 10 or 12 hours a day on your own, just pulling a sledge behind you. You know what I used to think? I used to think, this is easy peasy. This is so easy. This is the easy part of my job. Because all I've got to do here is work. I've been training for this. I've got experience in this. I've been training for ages for this. And also, because I'm a bit weird, I like suffering. It's my job. That's the easiest part of my job. I know where I'm heading. I've got, just got to head on south. Just keep on going down road. Working is the easiest part of a process. But being an enterprising person is more difficult. I'm not just saying that work is easy but what i'm saying is that work just doesn't add that much there are lots and lots of people that are working and lots of people live just working and dedicating themselves what we've got to do is we've got to add our little grain of salt to everything that's happening but that's all it that's just the minimum it's like saying oh it's important to know english no english is just the bare minimum that you need to know and say to your students okay if they don't need if they don't speak English, don't go and study a master's when they finish their degree. They need to go and be waiters in England and learn English just for six months or whatever. What really makes you different, what really adds value to what you do is being stuck out in that tent. That's what was difficult because you really don't know what to do. You're stuck there in that tent. You're blocked in. You, you, should I go out? Should I stay in? Should I make the effort? Should I stay here? Should I sit still? What am I doing here? I spent Christmas here. I spent New Year in that stupid tent. What about my children? What What am I doing here? Sometimes you stop. You stop fighting. You give up because you have no clear path. You don't know what you're doing there. You don't know which path to follow. That's why it's important that you have done your homework, your personal, your internal homework before going out, out there. And you've all been in this kind of a tent, I can guarantee you. You've all been in a situation in which you don't know what to do. And it would be nice if you could just solve that by just working for nine hours. But there are times when you just don't know what to do. And that's when an entrepreneur makes a difference because they know why they're there, what meaning does this ha have, why they need to carry on fighting, what they're risking. That's what, what's important when you're stuck in that stupid tent. Anyway, this is the journey around my office that I wanted to tell you about. And I'll end by saying that although it's true that uh, this word uh, entrepreneur is a great word, and I've been uh, enjoying this word for many years, but it's a bit hackneyed by now. I'm not going to deny that. It's a bit of a hackneyed phrase by now. But I don't know what entrepreneurship's going to look like in the future but all I do know is that if there's no entrepreneurship there'll be no future and I mean being an entrepreneur at all levels within your work in your life and you need to remember that the world is no longer uh, stable in the past there were just a few leaders and we just followed we just worked we just followed but you can't you've all got to lead now you've all got to get involved we've all got involved we're going to be proactive and we've got to form and that needs to be part of your life strategy, your enterprising life strategy. You're all entrepreneurs because you've all got students. You're all leading. You need to have an entrepreneurial spirit to move forward. And please, tell everybody about that. Tell your students about being enterprising because it's going to be key for their professional future, their personal future, whether they become entrepreneurs themselves or not. I think at the end of the day, an enterprising person isn't a matter of a, being a profession. I don't think a businessman is actually a profession. It's more a mental state. It's more uh, a way of being for people that want to discover the future and create the future. Thank you very much.